So this study started in the 1930s, oh, wow. so it's been going on for 85 years. It started with 724 young men, followed throughout their entire life. About two-thirds of the original participants were poor kids living in Boston's poorest neighborhoods, facing real challenges, and the remaining one-third were students at Harvard University. All right, uh, Bob, how many people have been in charge of moderating and managing this study? Uh, I'm the fourth director. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, the most famous are, scientific study and, on the planet. And Mark is the associate director. Yeah! But <laughs> this is, there have been hundreds of people who have worked on this project over 85 years. All right, what are the headlines thus far? Because it's ongoing. Two big headlines. Yeah. One isn't a surprise uh -huh. that you need to take care of your body like you're going to need it for 100 years. Yep. But the big surprise is that the quality of our relationships with other people don't just make us happier if we have good relationships. They keep us healthier and they help us live longer. That's the surprise. That's the thing we didn't believe when we first started to find this in our research. Mark, when did that first start to emerge? I would say about 20 or 30 years, we started to have an inkling in our own data. It was the relationship you had with your partner in your 50s that predicted how well you were aging late in life. So that was a sign, including your physical health. And then lots of other hints from our study. And then we looked because, as Bob said, we wanted to be careful. We're scientists. Yep. We wanted to check. And other studies were confirming that your relationships are connected to your health. They get inside your body, under your skin, and they help us live longer. And so what was sort of of emerging as a whisper um, then became a little louder and has continued to compound? Well, it has. And now we're figuring out how it works. Like, how do relationships actually protect our bodies? Yep. And the best hypothesis is that it's about stress, that re good relationships help us relieve stress. They help our bodies calm down. So if I have something really upsetting happen, I can go home, complain to my wife, and literally feel my body <laughs> calm down. If you don't have anybody you can call or go home to, we think the body stays in a kind of agitated fight or flight mode and gradually wow. higher levels of inflammation and stress hormones break down the body. So true. So therefore, the good life, um, which is the resultant, one of the resultants of this amazing, the longest scientific study, anthropological study, you know, of the modern age, therefore ever, um, is based around relationships. So you take, don't you, you take the sort of cornerstone, the foundation of, of your discovery, if you like, and then you say, right, okay, let's look at all relationships. That's what you do. Um, so let's start, let's start uh, with personal and then go on to friends and then go on to partners and then go on to work. So take those. Yeah, you talked about this load. So, so fill your boots off you go. Well, we think that everybody, whether you're shy or an extrovert, everybody needs one secure relationship. One. So okay. we asked our original people, who could you call in the middle of the night if you were sick or scared? And most people could list several people. Yep. Some people couldn't list anybody. Some people were married and couldn't list anybody who they could call if they were Or in tap trouble. on the shoulder even. Right, right, exactly. right. So what we believe is that everybody, all of us need at least one of those kinds of relationships in order to feel safe and secure in the world. Is that where you would begin, do you think? You can begin with that, but really important for listeners to recognize that you don't need to have an intimate relationship to thrive. You can get the things you need from relationships, from friends, from relatives, from neighbors, from people you work with, that it's all relationships end up mattering to us. And it makes sense. Relationships give us so many things. It's not just stress. There are many other things that they give us. It's a sense of identity. It's a place we have fun. So relationships turn out when we really think about it. They turn out to be incredibly important across a range of domains. You talk about work. I mean, all the chapters have self-explanatory headlines, and they're all amazing. You talk about work, relationships at work, being a different person at work to how you are at home, which itself can be exhausting. It's probably not advisable. Um, the fact that um, during COVID, a lot of people who didn't really get on with maybe their co-workers saw them at, on Zoom at home and saw a different person almost. And there are ways to build these bridges. Uh, you have examples of that. Um, there are ways 
ways of finding out that you have more in common with people that, first of all, you don't think you do. Can you speak to that for a second or two? Yeah, well, first, really important to recognize that a lot of us spend a lot of our waking hours at work. So it's a really important place to get nourished and relationships There's are a stat part there. Of... What's the stat? It's about hundreds of thousands of hours compared yeah. to a few thousand hours doing other things. Most of our waking hours are at work. It's 116,000 per lifetime or something stupid like something that. Something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, you know, really important that we not neglect what we are, you know, our, our, our bodies and our health at work. So uh, part of the trick is figuring out ways to make those connections. We all want to be seen and heard and understood. So what are the ways that work that we can connect with others in meaningful ways? And part of it is just being curious about other people, uh, being interested in, in what they're doing, what they're wearing. I'm looking around the studio, what people are wearing. I would ask you about, you know, what is that on your jacket? Marathon, <laughs> it says, you know, you're a marathoner, Chris. I didn't know that. Yeah, right? I you never know? talk about it. I yeah. talk about it all yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> this Sunday, you want to join? No. Come on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'd make it. No. We often talk about quality over quantity, uh, but that's not always the case, is it, to do with time and people. And we talk about money. You talk about the value of money in the book and, you know, where happiness really lies uh, and the fact that we often uh, take uh, fiscal phrases to to uh, ad adapt them to, or adopt them for conversation to do with time, uh, which is one currency we do all have in common. Can you speak to that for a bit, please? Right. We talk about spending time. Yeah. And it really, what we're really talking about is our attention. And one of the things that I know from my Zen practice is what my teacher taught me, which is attention is the most basic form of love. And that if we really give our full undivided attention to other people, it's the greatest gift we have to yeah. give. It's also the rarest because these wonderful screens that we're so addicted to keep grabbing our attention and taking it away from the people we care about. Yeah. So important to be as intentional as we can about where we direct our attention. Yeah. So you spend time and you pay attention, spending, paying, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you start each chapter off with amazing quotes. The one you just speaking to there was, uh, you know, the only true gift is a portion of yourself, um, things like that. You, you talk about participants in the study who have then benefited from it and some who haven't because they didn't want to and the ones who have uh, then again sort of confirm everything and get even happier and there's an upward spiral that you can jump on board if you if you like can you talk about some of those characters who have and haven't benefited from the study and, and why maybe yeah so th these were originally these are guys that were born in the 30s and 40s their wives joined the, joined the study later on and now we study the children of the original participants so men and women uh, but these were guys that weren't used to being asked questions about their lives and over 85 years we kind of poked and prodded them with different questions. Uh, and some of the questions were really hard, talking about challenging events in their lives, the kinds of regrets that they had. And what they told us, because we asked them, is that checking in regularly was a helpful thing for them. It allowed them to think about their lives, to reflect on what was working, what wasn't working. Um, so they found it helpful. And that was, in fact, part of the motivation for Bob and I to write the book, to provide a way for people to check in who weren't in our study. So we provide some exercises and some questions that are similar to the kinds of things that our participants did over the years. It's a fantastic book. You've done all the heavy lifting for us and you've made it a fun read and oh, it's, a, it's a compelling read. You also yeah. cite yourselves and your wives. Yeah. Um, so how did you two first um, hook up on a blind date and then what happened with your spouses? Because it <laughs> how speaks did, how to... What... we hook up yeah, on a blind date? Yeah, because you talk about it, don't you? We you talk do. about it in the book. So I was, I was initially officially... Mark's boss. He was my I boss. Was direct, I was directing the training program in which Mark was doing his internship, and right. I was the director of a psychiatry program. But I didn't know anything about research. Mark knew a lot about research. And so we ended up teaming up in a lab where we essentially were students, and we were students together and realized that we had a lot in common and really complementary skills. So we've had this partnership for almost 30 years. And you knew that this would be uh, cemented, solidified, and be more creative and more productive if your wives happened to get on. So you had to surreptitiously <laughs> see if that was going to be the case. How that, did that pan out? Mark? That was Bob's cleverness. So so Bob invited my wife, Joan, to dinner with his wife, Jennifer, and, and uh, we we hit it off and became friends and 
and both Jennifer and Joe and our wives are in London with us, and uh, they've been having fun together while Bob and I have been working. So, yeah, it makes for a wonderful. Bob and I have grown to be friends, and part of it is definitely through our wives as well. So yeah. when it began, different time, of course. It was it was a sexist um, study, wasn't it? It was and, definitely. And yeah. um, then you started, to, or the study, not you, but the study started to include the opinions of partners, the reflections of partners, all women, it has to be said. And now, of course, women and and um, uh, offspring uh, are, are continuing the study because the study is on going it doesn't die with the first participants in the study and you speak to the sexes in the book a lot and it's all unbelievably interesting and you cite the fact in black and white and you know because you're scientists and you have the data that men that that men are not as good at fre- the friendship thing than women what have you discovered about that well we looked into the research lots of research when we were writing the book to see what was what and in fact the differences between men and women aren't as big as we would think that, in fact, relationships are really important to men, too. They're not important. Not just to women. But... Important. Women do it differently. Women yeah. are more confiding. Women share more emotionally. Men do more stuff together. The way you describe it in the book, by the way, is perfect. You say women are f- more face-to-face and men are more side-by-side, yeah. which is football, which is doing mm. stuff, as yeah. opposed to talking about things. Running marathons. Running marathons. <laughs> <laughs> side-by-side and behind most of everybody else. Yeah. Um, so go on, t- speak more about men and women because it's so interesting. Well, and so what we find is that that actually it changes for men as well, that men soften and get more emotionally available, many of them, as they get older. We also learned from some research that boys, young teenage boys, actually have more emotionally confiding relationships with each other. And then as they get older, they think it's not macho it's yeah. not masculine it's and shame, so they, isn't it? they stop shame. confiding but we're hoping and we think that that younger generations of boys and men may may be raised with a different sense of what's possible if you're a man uh, right. what's possible in relation so so mark going forward um you know uh leaping forward if you can virtually you know the world has never been more connected but in many ways uh, has never been more isolated it can be, you know the whole thing social media or whatever uh, text whatsapp you know is the facade of community um but what's 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 the best of it and what's the worst of it yeah, so I think really important to start with this idea that technologies always give us challenges. So these men that we followed and their wives over time, they were introduced to phones in the homes. They were intrusive, and the families kind of didn't like that intrusion into the privacy of their home. So the trick is really taking advantage of these technologies. They certainly come with challenges. Um, we know that emotions are blunted. The less lifelike the technology mediation is, so texting is less emotional. We can't read cues in the same way, that it makes it harder to bond in a way that we truly feel close to others. And it also eliminates the Zoom meetings that we're all on, eliminate that kind of downtime that's important, the traditional water cooler, the coffee place at work. So we need to build those in, really critical to kind of let, not let the technologies lead us, but to decide what our priorities are and to build those into the technology. So I think we're trying to figure it out. And remote work has made it harder. The pandemic has made it much harder. So there's an epidemic of loneliness out there that we really need to address. Um, Really important to help people feel more connected. So yeah, really important this idea that some of the loneliest people, at least in the States, are young people that are spending massive amounts of time with lots of people like them. University kids are lonely. Uh, So it's not the physical isolation. It's a sense that other people don't know you, don't have your back, aren't, you're not connected to other people. And that's aversive for us. It turns out it's also corrosive for our health over time. And how much do we have to get on with it? Because uh, it's funny that your book and something else I was reading coincided as things like this often do about um, there will always be time for dot 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 not necessarily true there will always be time for dot 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 I will do what I really want to when dot 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 so there's the there will always be time for philosophy meets the when philosophy tell us about the dangers of those and tell us about the guy who in his 60s changed his life he's in the book and you know it's it's literally you say it's never too late so right. Right. We have so many pressures on us. You know, we're we've got our jobs, we've got our home lives, so many things to do. And we think, well, OK, I'll get to my relationships later. Uh, those friendships will always be there. But what we saw when we followed thousands of people is that some really good relationships would just wither away and die from neglect. And so 
what we found is that the the happiest people were the people who actively took care of their relationships every day, every week, would reach out to people, would make sure they connected with people. And so we had this one man in our study who didn't really have friends and he didn't have much of a marriage. And then when he was in his 60s and he retired, he joined a gym and he found a group of people who he loved and who loved him. And he started. they started hanging out together and doing all kinds of things together. For the first time in his life, he found friends when he thought it would never happen for him. So we have this chapter titled, It's, it's, it's a, Never Too it's, Late. It's my favorite, I Because think. When, you, when you follow a whole lot of lives, you realize there are all kinds of twists and turns that we never expect. And we're only getting one of them. That's the last we heard, at least anyway, um, in this skin and bag of bones uh, that we sort of tend to in habit right. every single day. Um, attention to relationships, your best investment. You you, you pre-reference chapter five and then post-reference it quite a lot. Do you, do you think that's a sem- the seminal chapter in the book? What, your social fitness? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So we, we saw that actually taking care of your social fitness like your physical fitness is something you want to do over and over again every day. You don't go to the gym once or run one marathon and say, good, I'm taken care of. My body's going to be fine. And you don't do that with your relationships either. And so what we find and what we'd like people to think about is how to be more active. I mean, you could think of somebody right now who you kind of miss, you haven't talked to in a while and just Think, send them a text, yeah. send them an email, call them on the phone and just say, hi, I was just thinking about you and wanted to connect. You'll be amazed at all the good stuff that comes back. To yeah. You. And that's having to do something. But, you know, we're a big fan on this show of dropping and stopping. So, you know, it's, if you want to, if you, if you need to stop something that's bad for you, all you have to do is stop. You just have to stop doing it. Whereas if you go to the gym, you got to get sneakers, you got to join a gym. Starting is a lot more sort of industrious and makes you feel better in the moment than maybe stopping, but stopping, cutting things off. Staying away from people, you know, watering the flowers as opposed to worrying about the weeds because the flowers will always overshadow the weeds anyway. Yep. What have you discovered about that? Well, I think there's so many distractions in this modern world. This idea about stopping what we're doing, not just moving without thought, like on automatic pilot, really critical. Otherwise, we get distracted. So the difference between the technologies now and the older technologies is they're really good at getting inside our pockets and in our heads totally. and cra- capturing our attention. So it's really critical, as Bob was saying, to to think intentionally what's important to me what's what are my priorities in life so my physical health my connections to others we want to figure out ways to to create time for that and it, we need to cancel out those messages we need to stop them from getting into our brains and here's the thing to stop so some research shows that if we simply passively consume social media content we get more depressed we get more anxious and our self-esteem goes down And, you know, because we're consuming other people's curated, edited lives, right? And then we think everybody else has a perfect life and I don't. So what we know is that if we can stop that, stop that passive consumption and start being more active, sorry, it's something you have to pick up and do. (laughs) Uh, But if we're more active, even on social media, actively connecting with people, we get happier. Yeah, depending on who they are and what they're talking about. One of my favorite thoughts is, um, you know, uh, the subject you choose to think about dictates the quality of your thoughts. Yep. So yeah. if you if you write the right shopping list at the beginning of every day, it's very difficult to have a bad day, which sounds crazy, but it is true. Well, I think you're talking partly about how much control we have over our well-being and our happiness. And it's pretty clear the research suggests this is glass half empty versus half full. It suggests about 50 percent of our happiness is determined by our genes. But that means means 50% is under our control, right? It's that shopping list that we make every day dictates what we're thinking about, what we do, our daily actions, all really important. Yeah, if you go for a walk in the park, it's difficult not to be on a walk in the park. Exactly, that right. That kind of thing. And I love the glass half full thing, because you will know this as a Zen friend. Um, you know, is your glass half empty or is it half full? And the answer to that is, of what? Because it's half full of water, but it's also half full of air. The glass is always full of something. Exactly. Well, and we can actively call to mind everything that's not wrong. We're so good. Our minds are good oh. at latching on to what's wrong <laughs> right now, right? We can latch on. So Thich Nhat Hanh, the wonderful Vietnamese Zen monk, said, let's celebrate today because it's a no toothache day. Yeah. You know, think about all the things that are not wrong. And if you call those to mind over and over again, you get happier. Research 
research shows us. It's you 100% true. do. It's an honour to meet to meet you two. Um, some of the participants were so committed to the study and so grateful for the study, they gave themselves to it for the whole of their lives. And then they said, what can we do after we're, we're no longer here? And some of them have gifted their brains to you. Yeah. It's yes. ex- extraordinary. So we have how many brains, Bob? It's between 25 and 30. 25 and, and 30 brains. Families will call us and reach out and said, you know, oh. this study was important to my dad, my mom. What is it that we can give you? We have his diaries. We have his journals. So they were quite devoted. And of course, you know, we feel incredibly grateful to them. What if you know somebody who's friendophobic, who just doesn't like it? Um, they're verging on being a misanthrope. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. is that a natural state or is there something going on there? I mean, you have to to be very careful when you you can't we say on the show all the time you can't check on people you can check in on people yeah, yeah. um give us some advice there well you know very important to check in on people uh but some people don't want others around one size never fits all when you study human okay. life right that a, that's and that's okay, okay right. that some okay. people are very content to spend most of their lives alone the great majority are not we evolved to be social animals right but It doesn't mean that the person who wants to spend most of their time alone uh, should be dragged out into into a party, right? It just not not necessary. What if they what if they do, but they just don't seem like they do? Well, there are ways to help people. So many people are frightened. Many people have the sense that people don't want them around, that the, the world doesn't want me. And so there are ways to reach out to those people uh, to help them feel safe in in dipping a toe in those social waters basically. And part of it is just realizing there's so many people that are lonely in our modern world. It's extraordinary. Almost a third of the population in, in the U.S. and in the U.K. It's just recognizing that you're not alone. And and this other idea I think is critical that, you know, we can, we come in different flavors. Some of us like spending time in crowds and loud places and some of us we do better with single people in a quieter spot. So those who might be more reluctant, they just need to find their place where they can connect. You talk about people generally in the book from the survey it's all general even though it's specific it's it's it starts specific and then it gets general the more people that are involved and the more variables that are involved and the more generations that are involved but you do say by and large if you live an examined life you stand more chance of being happier if you're sort of a normie to begin with and um, each of you in 30 seconds each if you don't mind what to you is an examined life an examined life is finding the activities that you care about and finding the people that you care about and who care about you. And if you can have those two things, you're having an examined and hopefully a good life. Can you add to that, Mark? Yeah, I think in addition, you know, just thinking hard about what's important to you, what are your priorities in life, and making sure that you pay attention to those and give your time to those things that are most important. And what about the anomaly of the plurality of the word priority? What, it, what about the plurality? What's, well, what do you uh, mean? Well, because the thing about having priorities is it comes ah, from the word okay. priority. Yeah. yeah. And so if you have 20 priorities, you're, in a, you're a super priority. You know, we're always we're <laughs> always figuring it out. Right. No, we never get to a point where we finally got it figured what's your, out. What's your priority? Life is all Give me good. your top three, Bob. My top three yeah. are doing things I like yeah. with people I care about yeah. and making sure I take the time to meditate every day. Okay, you can... and what about you, Mark? My family and people I care about, learning new things um, and enjoying myself. All right, well, listen, yeah. it's the best book. You pr- it might be the best book you read this year. Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz is The Good Life and How to Live It, Lessons from the World's Longest Study on Happiness. Um, everybody's given it blurb on the back. Everyone you've ever heard of, who's been, they've all been on this show, mm. yeah. giving it blurb on the back. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Have a lovely day. It's Such great a to pleasure. form a relationship with yeah, you. What a pleasure. <laughs> Good luck.